Welcome everybody. Uh, this is STEM Elevator uh, Pitch 3 um, of the 7th Polygen Symposium of Rising Scholars. I just want to give a great shout out to all of the students who are presenting today. This is a huge um, accomplishment for all of you and I hope you guys really enjoy it and that everyone in the audience is going to enjoy it as well. Uh, my name is Maiko Kitaoka. I'll be moderating the session today. And the goal really, as I mentioned, is to celebrate uh, these students and their work and, and showcase all the hard work that they did for their Polygens projects. Um, they've all worked super hard, super tirelessly um, over the past couple of months, and uh, we're here to really celebrate with them um, on their accomplishments. So uh, we are supposed to have eight students. I think we'll actually end up uh, with a few less uh, in the session today, uh, presenting on a wide variety of topics. And we do have a fellow Polygens member um, who will be scoring and judging uh, these students. And so uh, you'll be able to uh, see who wins some prizes later uh, after the event. So for the audience, um, any of you, if you have questions uh, during each student's talk, please feel free to put that in the Q&A and uh, we will have time at the end to take questions. And so now it is um, my great, uh, I'm really excited to uh, introduce all of these speakers. So we have Theodora Di Tommaso, um, Anona Joshi, Sophia Liu, Amanda Durr, um, and Gwandi Wong here. I'm really excited for all of you and let's kick it off uh, with Theodora. Take it away. Okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen. It wasn't working for slideshow, so I'm just gonna share it like this. So I wanna start off with a quick introduction. Hi, my name is Theodora Di Tommaso and I'm a senior at the Beacon School this year. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And obviously, as you know, this project was brought to you with the help of the Polygens program, as well as my matched mentor, Abby Richberg, who's actually out running a marathon right now. So everyone wish her luck. So yeah, let's get right into it. Whether by simply choosing to take that morning walk or finally investing in the gym membership we've been debating, it is more likely than not that you've ever made an effort to increase your level of physical activity. When building healthy habits like these, early intervention is crucial in making them last. So I've included here a segment from one of my sources that speaks to this level of priority. Um, in summary, the author highlights that providing young children with an environment that nurtures a love for learning, encourages early socially friendly tendencies that facilitate the intellectual abilities that one needs to build and retain healthy habits. So for that reason exactly, I'm beyond thrilled to present my research-based children's book, Find Your Fit. As readers embark on a head-to-toe adventure through the human body, they engage with biological, anatomical, and nutritional concepts that are often found to be too advanced for young children. Aiming to overcome these educational barriers, Find Your Fit provides readers with the information that is necessary to properly understand and appreciate their bodies. At our first stop, we meet Amelia an astronaut that works in the neuron galaxy, which we can see here revolves around the pituitary gland planet. It's this little pink planet right over here. Um, Amelia informs readers of how the brain communicates through presenting the structure of a neuron, which has the soma, which is the cell body, axons which send messages, dendrites which review those messages, and then synapse, which are gaps basically where one neurotransmitter travels between one neuron and another. And so she does this while also explaining the benefits of increased physical activity on the mind. In her free time, we can see that Amelia likes to play football with her friends, emphasizing the importance of wearing her properly fitted helmet for injury prevention. The book introduces seven other main characters in this structure, a kingdom guard, construction worker, musician, grocer, artist, teacher, and pilot. Each character continues to symbolically embody an anatomical structure or system ultimately covering the head slash brain, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, skin, spine, heart slash lungs, digestive systems, arms, reproductive systems, and legs slash feet. As seen with Amelia, each character is involved with a specific sport as a means to take care of their body, explaining their sports relevance to the overall theme of the book. A great variety of sports are involved, including swim, gymnastics, hockey, and track. 
By the end of the adventure, readers are encouraged to share how they find their fit. While categorized as a children's book, I guarantee that anyone and everyone will be able to take away a greater meaning upon reading. Committed to creating a community that promotes diversity and inclusion, I hope that every reader will also be able to develop personal connections over shared traits with the characters. Thank you so much for providing me your undivided attention today, and I hope you check out the finalized book on Amazon in your future. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, oh, there's my video. Uh, excellent job. Um, so again, for those in the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to put that in the Q&A uh, for Theodora. And in the meantime, while we wait for um, questions to trickle in, I just wanted to ask sort of what was the most challenging part about putting this all together? Like, I'm super impressed that you basically put together a children's book. You're going to be a published author on Amazon, which is fantastic. Um, that seems really challenging. So how, what, what did you find to be um, the most challenging part of this? Yeah, so my mentor and I actually spent, I think it was probably like the first half of the sessions, just really laying out the structure for the book. We looked up tons of resources and we're still adding on to them because the book is still in progress. I think right now we're at anywhere from like 20 to 25 to 30 sources. Um, so now we have this full master document where I have uh, my visual ideas for the book, the anatomical structure that I would like to include. Um, anything that has to do with physical activity and just all that information in the corresponding documents that I would like to include obviously after in my reference page. Um, but I'm not, I'm more of a dancer. I'm not very visual of an artist. So I think honestly, the hardest part would have to be drawing it. You wouldn't realize how much time it takes, but details are just very nitpicky. Um, so we thank you for that. We have a question uh, from the audience, which is, how did you get inspiration to do this project? Of course. Um, so I grew up, as I just mentioned, dancing. And so physical activity is something that I find very important to me. Um, as well, I've also always had a love for science, as we can see here, we're in the STEM chat. Uh, so I just wanted to combine something with the two when I found that focusing on physical activity and youth, especially because I would like to be a pediatrician in my future, uh, that this would just be the perfect project to do so. And obviously choosing to do a children's book was something that I could use my creative side. And it also made the research and all the information that I put so much work into accessible to kids. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure it was something that anyone would be able to enjoy. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we'll move on to our next speaker for the day. Um, thank you, Theodora. And next up we have Anona Joshi. Take it away. Hi everyone, um, just as a quick introduction, my name is Anona and I'm a senior at the Lincoln School in Rhode Island. And today I'll be sharing my research proposal with you that I've been working on in the past few months, along with my mentor, whose name is Stephen Brerin. Whether you listen to music during your morning commute or have been playing an instrument for many years of your life, it is likely that music has played an important and beneficial role in your life. But the question I'm wondering and trying to answer is, can music also play a meaningful role in the lives of early stage Parkinson's patients? And this is the question that I dedicated my research to. And here I propose a research study examining the effects of music therapy on improving Parkinson's patient's symptoms. Just as a quick definition, Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurologic disorder, which generally affects the control of body movement due to a loss of nerve cells in the reward system of the brain. There is not yet a cure for Parkinson's. However, research suggests that music therapy may improve a patient's symptoms by activating the affected regions of the brain and incre increasing the production of dopamine, which is usually redu reduced in Parkinson's patients. Parkinson's patients face many difficulties, even in earlier stages of the disease, some of which are problems performing daily activities, lack of coordination, and often, unfortunately, the development of depression and anxiety, and overall, lower self-reports of quality of life. This study proposal builds off of previous research and proposes the use of an active music therapy intervention which involves patient-driven musical improvisation or composition rather than simply listening to music. 
This proposal seeks to recruit early stage Parkinson's patients from clinics and nursing homes who would have guided time to play instruments, as well as rhythm-based drumming and small groups in short sessions for a total of eight weeks. The intervention would be guided by an examiner or coordinator and patient questionnaire results would be recorded by a research assistant. Individualized music therapy would allow patients to progress through the intervention at their own pace and therefore observe changes in quality of life factors like happiness, stress levels, and confidence in daily tasks. Through the study proposal, I hope to observe beneficial changes in patient reported quality of life. In order to record progress, the common quality of life and universal Parkinson's disease rating scales will be administered to patients. I also hope to emphasize the need for research not only on patient symptoms, but also on the psychological well being and mental health of patients suffering from neurodegenerative disorders. The proposed research could also help the scientific community better understand the relationship between music therapy and Parkinson's disease and possibly offer insight into factors that may affect patient symptoms in early stages of Parkinson's. Although more research is needed, of course, in this area to support widespread use of music-based therapies, I hope that with my research, I can shed light on the seemingly simple and often overlooked ways of improving the qualities of the many lives affected by Parkinson's. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Sorry. All right, thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, again, as we wait for questions to trickle in, I'm actually very curious to know where you see yourself going next with this research. It sounds like you have basically the beginnings of a clinical trial proposed and I wanna know um, where you're going after that. Uh, thank you for the question. I think I got really excited about the prospect of carrying this out in the future, um, whether that's through um, my undergraduate years in college or after that. Um, obviously, it is a clinical trial that would require many resources and many moving parts that would come together eventually. So I definitely plan to carry this out. I really would like to see um, this plan of mine come to fruition, um, because I think that it's very important to me individually. Um, and also, I just love to combine two things I'm passionate about, music and science. And knowing that that's a direction I want to take in college, I will definitely try to make that happen um, as a clinical trial, either as an undergrad or after that, if I can. That's amazing. Um, and related to that, we have a question um, from the audience. How did you get the idea to link music therapy with Parkinson's disease? Yeah, so um, originally I was inspired to um, carry out this project because um, I've had family members who have struggled with Parkinson's. And actually, the link I made was because I used to um, perform music and sing for my grandfather when he had Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And I saw as a young child, I'm talking maybe five or six years old, um, that it seemed to help him and seemed to relax him. And something as simple as that inspired me many years later to um, see if I could have that level of an effect on Parkinson's patients early stage and otherwise um, as an older as a teenager now, but then also if I end up and when I end up conducting the clinical trial. Um, and I think that connection is something I just had this far-fetched idea for, but then in the first few sessions with my mentor, we sort of hashed out the details of what my project could look like. And I initially intended to have a research paper written by the end of my project, but instead, it sort of transformed into this proposal that I hope to carry out. What a wonderful story. Thank you so much for sharing that with all of us. And we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Anona. All right, so next up we have Sophia Liu. Take it away. Okay, hi everyone, um, I'm Sophia, and I'm currently a student at Belmont High School in Belmont, Massachusetts. 
Um, I go by she, her, and today I'm going to be presenting um, my findings from my review paper. So my project combines my interest um, in the field of immunology um, with my passion for climate change into a, re a review paper on the key ways that increased pollution from climate change can affect pollen-induced respiratory allergies, asthma. Um, so why this topic? Uh, my desire to explore this topic stems from my personal struggle with allergies and seeing how that struggle is reflected in over 235 million others worldwide has motivated me to deeply investigate the many facets to this question. Um, so many of you might know about or even have allergies, but here's a little background on allergic rhinitis, also known as hay fever or pollen allergies. So um, allergic rhinitis is the most common type of chronic immunological disorder that involves the entire respiratory system. Immune cells are alerted upon the body's exposure to an allergen, um, in this case, pollen. Um, and this sets off a chain of cellular events that result in promoting IgE production. Um, so IgE is like an antibody that's shaped like a Y. Um, one side will like bind to a mast cell and the other side will like catch, kind of like catch the pollen. Um, and this leads to um, the release of histamines from the mast cell. And the histamines are what cause the allergic reactions, um, like the symptoms that you might know, like itchy eyes, um, sneezing, and like asthma, for example. So I primarily studied the different ways pollution and climate change um, can exacerbate allergic symptoms. And I found that rising levels of CO2 can drive the carbon fertilization effect, um, which is an increase in plant photosynthesis in response to increased levels of atmospheric CO2. And under current rates of progression, CO2 levels as well as temperatures are expected to increase, which will cause plants to produce significantly higher amounts of proteins. Um, allergenic proteins. Um, in addition, the window of pollination has also shifted. Pollen seasons have become longer and more allergen filled due to the general trend of milder winters and warmer summers caused by climate change. I also found that chemical pollutants can enhance the immunogenicity of pollen grains. Air pollutants can damage the pollen cell wall and cause allergens within the pollen grain to be released into the environment where they will eventually enter a person's lower respiratory tract. And this is an important detail because usually pollen grains aren't small enough to enter a person's lower respiratory tract, but these new like enhanced pollen particles can, and therefore they pose a very potent threat to people with allergies. Um, in addition, air pollutants can also act as adjuvants through binding with the allergens to simulate a stronger allergic response. These little exhaust particles, for example, can enhance ragweed allergen to induce higher IgE production, which will in turn elicit a stronger allergic response. And finally, pollutants can influence the phenotypic plasticity of allergenic proteins. For example, a study showed that um, the same pollen from an urban environment was more allergenic and abundant than that from a rural environment. The high expression of allergenic proteins can lead to an increase in the prevalence of allergic diseases, which make our next actions as the main drivers of pollution and climate change all the more important for our own respiratory health and for the health of generations to come. Ultimately, improved knowledge of the ways climate change and air pollution can enhance the effects of allergic rhinitis is imperative in driving us to take steps to reduce anthropogenic air pollution if not for our planet, then at least for ourselves and for our loved ones. Thank you. And um, shout out to my mentor, Reed, who really helped me with all this. Um, he was really knowledgeable and like basically taught me uh, most of the things I know about immunology and allergies. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was really interesting. Um, I think we all are aware of uh, a lot of the negative effects of climate change. Um, so I just wanted to ask um, for you specifically, what did you find to be the most unexpected um, new fact or new um, discovery during your research? Um, I was particularly surprised that 
Well, most of the things I found I was surprised by because I had no idea that these things could happen. Um, but I think I was most surprised that like air pollutants can actually enhance the allergenicity of pollen, um, of like the allergen, um, because like we're like cars are producing like um, like these diesel exhaust particles like every single day, and um, every single one of those diesel exhaust particles can really enhance the allergen allergenicity of a pollen grain, and each pollen grain can in turn cause um, stronger allergic responses in people. So that also made me wonder like the chain effect of this, like will it build up over time? Um, basically, yeah, it caused like slight panic, but it was, it was cool to know. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. When you think about pollution, when you think about climate change and all the ways that it's kind of insidious in our lives, it is kind of panicky uh, when you realize that. Is, did you learn anything in your research that made you want to change either a daily habit or kind of how um, you were interacting um, with the world? Actually, yes. Um, so I do have a section in my re review paper that details like the things we humans can do. Um, but one of the things I found out was to use less air conditioning because air conditioning uses a lot of electricity, um, electricity, you know, burning fossil fuels, chain reaction. Um, so after like I like knew about that, I tried to reduce the amount of AC I was using in my own room um, because that's something like I can live without, like I can just go to the basement, you know? So if you want like an easy way to like reduce um, your pollution, maybe just turn off the AC, you know? <laughs> Wise words. <laughs> Excellent. So if you live in a place where it doesn't get too hot or you are okay finding alternative methods of cooling down when it's hot, try to reduce the amount of AC you use. That doesn't seem too bad. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sophia. We're going to move on to our next speaker, which is Amanda Durr. It's all yours. All right. Hi, my name is Amanda and I'm a current senior at Los Altos High School in California. Uh, I use she, her pronouns and I will be discussing the contents of my research paper that I've been working on for the past few months. Nearly one sixth of the population, up to one billion people have a neurodegenerative disorder. As time passes, this number will only increase. An increased life expectancy overall has been linked to a higher percentage of the population contracting neurodegenerative disorders. Moreover, the cost of living for those with such disorders, including fees for care and treatment, is becoming exceedingly expensive. For Alzheimer's especially, as of 2014, the cost of care was up to $200 billion each year and is expected to pass $1 trillion by 2050. With such growing statistics, improved medicines or means of treatment are necessary. Over the past few months, I have been privileged enough to be able to research one of the most promising treatments in development, that involves increase in patients' cerebral dopamine neurotrophic factor, abbreviated as CDNF. CDNF is a protein that is naturally found in the ER that helps us adapt and respond to any ER stress conditions that would have otherwise stopped regulating proteins in a cell necessary to maintain the health of the organism. However, levels of CDNF decrease as we age, as with other neuroprotective molecules, so our brain has become more vulnerable to degeneration over time. A primary solution is administering therapeutic CDNF to support the function of dopamine producing nerve cells involved in many bodily functions, including memory, movement, and mood. It also modulates the hippocampus, a brain structure largely involved with long-term memory. Until recently, CDNF was thought to only impact the dopamine system in the midbrain. However, when a 2020 study used gene knockout to remove the CDNF from a group of zebrafish, they found links to behavioral abnormalities, impaired social cohesion, and increased susceptibility to seizures. All of these symptoms have been linked to regions of the brain beyond the dopamine system, suggesting that CDNF can impact neurogenesis, the process by which new neurons are formed in the brain. Because of CDNF's link to neurogenesis, it can be inferred that CDNF can help prolong the effects of neurodegeneration by reducing the rate at which these neurons degenerate, which is incredibly useful in terms of treating neurodegenerative disorders. CDNF has, has proved especially helpful in Alzheimer's disease. 
In a 2015 study, scientists injected recombinant human cDNF and viral vectors into 11 to 14 mice with mutations associated with early Alzheimer's and another 11 to 14 wild type mice as their control. This is similar to how humans are injected with a viral vector vaccine when getting, say, a flu shot. They used the Morris water maze where animals swim, swam across a tank to find a platform below the surface of the water in a series of trials. As it turns out, CDNF improves the long-term spatial memory as a vastly higher percentage of CDNF mice were able to consistently find the platform quickly. Its effect on these neurons implies similar improvement in other areas as injecting injection of CDNF has a high distribution rate as opposed to other neurotrophic treatments, meaning that it is able to improve multiple areas of the brain at once. Though current treatments cannot prevent the death of dopaminergic neurons, the hope is that in the future, scientists will develop a therapy that can not only prevent the death of such neurons, but also allow for their regeneration. In this sense, regardless of the unknowns to be discovered during testing, CDNF research may help develop a more effective treatment for neurodegenerative disorders, and I hope to continue my involvement with this in my undergraduate years and beyond. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Amanda. Again, reminder to our attendees to just put questions in the Q&A if you have them for any of our speakers. Um, we'll have a little bit of time at the end to have a collective sort of Q&A. Um, but Amanda, I'm really interested uh, to know sort of what drew you specifically to uh, this model of uh, CDNF um, treatment for Alzheimer's. That sounds to me a little bit unconventional. Most of the time with Alzheimer's, you kind of hear about these amyloids or like protein degradation problems. And so I kind of wonder how you got into this sort of specific avenue. Um, so, well, uh, I already knew that I wanted to research uh, neurodegenerative disorders, uh, simply just because of how prevalent they are in life, and they're kind of um, disregarded in a sense at some points. Um, and then I discovered CDNF with the help of my mentor during one uh, early stages of research where we were looking at YouTube videos, and one of them offhandedly mentioned CDNF as a potential treatment. and um, I ultimately decided to look more into it and discovered that um, even though it's still very early on in its testing phase, it is a very viable um, source to treat such uh, disorders. That's really cool. So what do you hope to do um, in the future with, with this new knowledge and this new research? Uh, for obvious reasons, I haven't really been able to test personally with it, meaning that I cannot actually inject mice with viral vectors. Um, but I hope that um, given undergraduate and graduate resources for um, internships or research, I will be able to like personally be involved and get some hands-on experience. That's amazing. I hope you get there too. All right. Well, we're going to move on now to Guandi Wong. Thank you, Amanda. Sorry, I was muted. Hello, uh, my name is Guandi, and I'm currently a senior at Woodward School in Sandy, Utah. So um, I worked on this research project with my mentor, Hannah Strode, over the summer, and I came up with a research paper. So my project is about the Pyongyang issue found on composite aircrafts like Boeing 787s and Air, uh, Airbus A350s. So this issue is that people can see a layer of paint not adhered to aircraft fuselage, and uh, which sounds really dangerous and it certainly is. So this will cause unsteady airflow. So to visualize the problem, I have a few pictures for you to see this. So you can see this is Qatar Airways A350 and you can see the paint peeling off, cracking from the fuel sludge. So um, I studied the relationship between this issue and the heavy use of composite air, uh, composite materials on aircraft fuselage and wings. And I conducted experiments to test my hypothesis. So um, uh, the peeling paint issue is a result of incohesiveness between the carbon fiber composites, the epoxy resin, and the paint layers. So, I, uh, so to simulate the real conditions of the materials, I compared each exper experimental material to the one that is used on airplanes 
based on their mechanical properties. So the coefficient of thermal expansion and, and the Young's modulus. And I spread the epoxy resin and paint to the carbon fiber boards. For the simulated real environment, I searched for the lowest and highest temperature uh, that aircraft's likely to encounter, which are negative 22 degrees Celsius minimum uh, at cruising altitude and 50 degrees Celsius um, maximum at the hottest airport on this planet, which is the Quid Airport. And, and I used a fridge and oven to simulate the environment. Well, to um, make sure that the compression and expansion on airplane fuselage and wings are, are uh, correctly simulated, uh, I um, discovered, like, I researched for the difference in pressure and lift force. So I used the 500 gram weight to stretch the carbon fiber boards either vertically or bend them. And uh, the value of 500 grams was derived from a physics equation that involves the measurement of the carbon fiber thickness and also the force applied to airplane fuel sludge. Uh, one of the most challenging part during this experimental process was how to place each, um, each piece of carbon fiber board into the containers, uh, which are the simulators. So I tried multiple solutions and I decided to drill holes and um, to drill holes on the carbon fiber boards and hung them on a platform with a string and added weight when needed. So uh, this is how I um, drill the holes. You can see on the picture on the left. And also I have them vertically uh, or horizontally on the, board, uh, on the platform with a string and added weight um, below them. Um, so I looked for signs of cracking and peeling paint um, on the layers and recorded the results. However, none of the 12 sets show the signs of pill and paint after just one cycle of testing or after four cycles being in hot and cold environments. Well, this topic um, requires long-term contribution and it's certainly um, nearly impossible to come to a conclusion from one person. Well, although my experiment didn't prove uh, whether the pill and paint issue is a result of using composite materials like carbon fiber reinforced plastic, it does pave a path for future explorations where I could adjust my um, environmental conditions and the number of cycles. So uh, what's important is that I learned that only several cycles of testing is not gonna be much different from hundreds of cycles based on what airplanes likely to encounter um, uh, in the air. And I also need to dig into the aspects that influenced the paint that I didn't discover in this research for future explorations. Through this research project, I plan to build a foundation in the field of engineering to prepare for my, for my career designing advanced aircraft and embracing all facets of aviation. So um, this is my project and thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, all right, we're switching gears a little bit into some aerospace engineering, which is super fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask if your research actually maybe changed your uh, attitude towards taking airplanes or looking out for certain things when you're on an airplane yourself. Uh, it did not change my uh, opinion on this because I'm an airplane enthusiast and really love uh, whatever happened on airplanes, even though that's like a problem. So I think, uh, I mean, this is a way that I can discover in this field and uh, prepare myself to maybe improve some of the issues um, currently happening on the airplanes. I mean, nothing on airplanes are um, perfect. So, I mean, that's the chance I get for, for being an engineer in aviation. That's amazing. I'm looking forward to the, the next model of airplanes where you actually solve some of these problems and make the world a little safer up there. Thank you. All right. Um, so let's see. Uh, if there are any more questions, please feel free uh, to put them in the Q&A. Um, that is actually all of our speakers. So I also firstly want to give them a huge round of applause. Um, all of these presentations are fantastic um, and really uh, gives us a broad range of what Polygen students are able to accomplish. So I want to give all of you a round of applause. You should be really proud of yourselves. Um, and 
that is actually going to be the end of our session. Um, we're ending early just because we do have a few speakers missing um, and everyone was super great and kept to their five minute uh, elevator pitch time. So thank you guys so much for that. Um, I will stick around um, for a few minutes and I also ask the speakers to stick around just in case there are a few questions, but uh, we'll close out uh, this uh, session in about two minutes or so. So thank you everybody.